And now we come to number nine in the Confucian way, water and flow. It was the ordinariness of water which was its attraction in the Confucian tradition. It was familiar and essential part of our everyday lives, an old friend which we knew well. Contemplating water should teach us lessons about reality. It was familiar to the Chinese of Confucius' time because of the great rivers in China and the streams and the irrigation ditches which they built. These are referred to, these irrigation channels are referred to over and over again. And learning things from the ordinary is one of the lessons provided by this philosophy. It's not that we wait for the momentous event, the transforming event of the now, but we look at the everyday and we concentrate on what we learn from it and how we for perform our tasks within the everyday. The everyday is where we live. The Chinese word shui includes all forms of water, including cultivated water, rivers, floods, water in all its moods. And all these kinds of water lie in the background of the Confucian idea of the life force. This idea was developed much later into the idea of qi, which is quite well known in the West as the life force, which infuses both breath and bodily fluids. It was an idea developed much later by the Neo-Confucian thinkers of the Song Dynasty from the 10th to the 13th century AD, and it was to play a predominant role in Chinese thinking about health, though in Confucius it's present in only a very limited form. Clearly Confucius has the irrigation model of water in mind because he speaks of the need to control flow, the flow of our personalities. When I say personalities, I should caution against the idea that there is a mind-body distinction or a dualism, in that the body and the person are one, in Confucius' view, one and the same. Analects 16.7 reads, When one is young, and one's blood and chi are not yet settled, one's guard is against lust. When one has reached maturity, and one's blood and chi are firm, one's guard is against aggressiveness. When one has reached old age and one's blood and chi are in decline, one's guard is against acquisitiveness. So like Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, Confucius thinks that old men are acquisitive. And it's interesting to note that this observation crosses cultures in this way. Aristotle is very severe on old age and adds to this tendency towards greed a number of other problems with old age, including negativity, lack of energy, a tendency to qualify everything. In addition, the elderly are malicious and mistrustful. They do everything for gain and even their love and hatred is qualified as they love as if their love might easily turn into hatred, and they hate the same way. If you think that's bad, see what he says about young people. Aristotle does sing the praises of middle-aged people, as they have some of the energy of youth, but they have also learnt from mistakes, and are somewhat wiser. They have the sense of the mean, the middle way, in that their passion is tempered by control and their hope is tempered by experience. Daniel Bell notes in one of his books that Lee Kuan Yew, former Prime Minister of Singapore, attempted to propose the introduction of double voting weights 
for middle-aged people in Singapore in 1994, so that middle-aged people would have double the number of votes of the young or the elderly. But this was not implemented. It sounds as if he was heeding the advice of Aristotle more than Confucius, in that it is Aristotle who so handsomely eulogised people in the middle-aged group. There's always an observational or empirical element to Aristotle, and he was obviously describing what he saw and was attempting to generalise about the categories of people he observed. Perhaps Singapore is more an Aristotelian society than a Confucian one. As for the notion of qi, Confucius seems to indicate a kind of life force which is a combination of blood and spiritual energy, which waxes in youth and wanes in old age. This life force should be thought of as akin to the flow of water, which is channeled. That's to say, it is the irrigation model, which is in the mind of Confucius. It is not the model of the floods of water, which can come from time to time, or a torrent pouring from a waterfall, but water controlled and managed, sedately going about its business. Scholars emphasise that we should be careful of a Western-style dualism, a Cartesian dichotomy, that's a reference to Descartes, a Cartesian dichotomy between spirit and matter, and that there is no abrupt division between the two in Confucius. This is not to say that everything is reduced to matter and that there is only a materialist explanation of psychological phenomena. That would be to introduce a Western manner of thinking with its binary alternatives, suggesting that qi must be one or the other nor is it a matter of metaphor, as I have suggested before, as we're talking about embedded realities which contain similarities and which are therefore to be compared to each other or even identified with each other. Mencius later on develops this idea of qi, but he does treat it as flood-like, in that it fills the body. He was being questioned on how to obtain the state of having an unperturbed heart. And here he emphasizes that the will must remain in command of qi, while the qi actually fills the body. It is possible to abuse your qi and the will must respect it. Mencius says, This, it is difficult to explain. This is a chi which is in the highest degree vast and unyielding. Nourish it with integrity and place no obstacle in its path and it will fill the space between heaven and earth. It is a chi which unites rightness and the way. Deprive it of these and it will collapse. It is born of accumulated rightness and cannot be appropriated by anyone through a sporadic show of rightness. Whenever one acts in a way that falls below the standard set in one's heart, it will starve. Hence I said that Khao Tzu never understood rightness, because he looked upon it as external. You must work at it, and never let it out of your mind. At the same time, whilst you must level it out of your mind, you must not forcibly help it to grow either. This is a significant development from the thought of Confucius, but is probably aligned with it. We should note the delicate interaction of the will and the life force, qi, and by the sake token, Note that this life force is not anything like the libido 
envisaged by Freud. It's also worth noting that Mencius says it's difficult to explain, and this difficulty seems to be tied in with the complexity of the number of factors needed to achieve balance in one's life. It is not just the will which can have a balancing effect, but also one's sense of rightness and what is appropriate. I do not mean to refer here to some notion of conscience or guilt feelings, but to rightness or appropriateness itself, not even a sense of rightness. This sense of rightness or appropriateness cannot be forced or be external in its manifestation, like the external show of piety which Jesus rebuked in the Pharisees. Mencius is talking about accumulated rightness, coming through a lifetime of practised benevolence. One sets the standard in one's own heart as a carpenter sets a level. And if that falls below the standard, one is abusive of one's chi. In achieving this balanced life force, one reaches a kind of harmony with nature and the world, and there is no sense in which there is domination or lordship over the world. Granted, there may be some struggle, as self-discipline and self-examination is involved. Mencius also speaks of the way, and there is always something indefinable about the way, the Tao something you have to find yourself, and something which is hard. In neither Confucius nor Mencius are there easy answers about what the way is. So the route to a balanced life force is not easily specified, but neither is it a personal Calvary. Thank you for joining me. And next time we will talk about water again and the idea of stillness and in particular the water as mirror.